The following program is a presentation of Grace Communion International and Grace Communion Seminary and is made possible by generous donations from viewers like you. On this episode of You're Included, theologian Dr. George Hunzinger talks about the importance of being focused on Christ and the relational nature of the Eucharist. Our host is Dr. J. Michael Fazell. It's a pleasure to have you here again. Thank you very much. We'd like to talk about uh, one of the subjects you brought up in your book, How to Read Karl Barth, and that is Ordo Salutis and how that plays out. Um, could you begin by talking about what, or telling us what it means in English and then uh, what the history and... Yeah, Ordo Salutis means order of salvation. And th this idea, this term, comes from the 17th century. Uh, actually, I tend to think about these things more from uh, the standpoint of Calvin and Luther and the original reformers and not what the later, more scholastic theologians did uh, uh, 75 to 100 years later. But uh, is there a temporal sequence in which things have to fall, or if not, are there ways in which one thing necessarily presupposes something else first? Like, can I have faith without having first repented? See, that, that might be temporal, but it might also be logical. The very idea of faith presupposes that I have repented. Uh, Calvin thought repentance, for example, was a lifelong process. Uh, sometimes it's related to how justification and sanctification are related. So. Uh, first, you would be justified in point of time, and then uh, that would kick off a process of sanctification. Uh, but it might be not temporal, but logical. You couldn't uh, be in the process of sanctification if you had not logically already been justified. And where does adoption fit in? Do you have to be adopted first in order to be justified and, and then sanctified? And actually, one that I think is uh, pretty important and is not always but sometimes brought out in this idea of ordering is when do you enter into union with Christ? The Calvin's idea was that the person is brought into union with Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit who creates faith. So Calvin taught that faith is the principal work of the Holy Spirit and faith joins us to Christ, and then Calvin would use the word simul, and then simultaneously, uh, out of union with Christ, uh, there's a double grace. He put it, duplex gratia dei, a, a twofold grace of God, justification and sanctification. So Calvin did not make uh, sanctification dependent upon justification. He made justification and sanctification dependent upon union with Christ. Uh, I, I, that's the order that I myself would hold to. But there's another order that you find in some of the later Lutheran theologians that you have to be justified first in order to enter into union with Christ and, and to participate in Christ. Uh, that almost seems contrary to Luther to me insofar as I understand it because of Luther's emphasis, as I mentioned uh, uh, in an earlier segment, that grace comes to lost sinners. So uh, grace brings us into union with Christ. Uh, Christ enters into us. We enter into Christ. There's a kind of mutual indwelling. Uh, you don't have to be made holy or righteous in order uh, to have union with Christ. It's union with Christ which brings about uh, justification and sanctification, righteousness, and life. Uh, that, I think, is uh, at least one way in which the question of the order of salvation is still important. Uh, does union with Christ depend upon repentance or justification or some other thing, or is it the foundation of everything else? You know, Calvin and Bard, and if I'm not mistaken, also Luther, all believed that union with Christ was bedrock and was given by grace through faith. And every other aspect of salvation, whatever it might be, comes out of that uh, 
but from that point on, it's a kind of a hodgepodge. There's, there's no clear order. It, there, there's no logical uh, set of uh, ordering principles, no, no temporal order. Uh, the important thing is union and communion with Christ by grace through faith. Uh, and after that, uh, the idea of ordo salutis becomes uh, kind of a distraction. You know, a, it, it does direct your attention to how you're doing in living out the Christian life as, as opposed to keeping your focus on Christ alone. It, it's almost like you know, Peter being out there on the water, you know, and he, he's looking at Christ, but all of a sudden the question of ordo salutis arises and he looks to himself and starts sinking. You know, you know I mean, uh, th there's a way in which uh, uh, Christian piety can become too preoccupied with itself and the ordo salutis concept is perhaps one way in which that is uh, fostered. I mean, the, the important thing is, is to keep our focus on Christ. In your recent book, The Eucharist in Ecumenism, uh, it shows that you, you, you have a passion for unity in Christ between churches and the ability to take communion together. Um, what, what triggered that? What lay behind your um, uh, interest in the topic and development of it? Well, I mean, if you think about it, uh, it's profoundly disordered that we should have so many separate churches and denominations. Uh, Jesus came that we might all be one. And uh, if we have reached the point where some Christians are excluded from the Lord's Supper or the Eucharistic celebrations of other Christians, uh, this is uh, not only wrong in itself, but it's a terrible testimony to the world. I, I read a story recently about uh, a man in India who was a Dalit, so a member of the Untouchables. And uh, he became a Christian and he would, had been a leader among the Dalits and he said, you know, Christianity recognizes the, uh, the dignity and the full humanity of all human beings and therefore of the untouchables. Uh, we should all become Christians. And the response he got back was, we can't become Christians because if we did, we would lose our uh, unity as Dalits. Uh, of course, a lot of them have become Christians uh, anyway, but uh, it's a sign of how the missionary movement imported the divisions that had grown up uh, in Europe to the rest of the world uh, by reproducing those divisions in, in the mission field. Well, the, the ecumenical movement in recent times has actually come out of the missionary movement. You know, in uh, the, the great uh, conference that took place in Edinburgh in 1910. So it was missionaries gathering together to see what could be done to try to recover some more robust uh, uh, expression of Christianity so that it wouldn't be undermining the efforts that they were uh, engaged in uh, around the world. Uh, so it just seems profoundly wrong to me that uh, Christians uh, have allowed things to get to the point that uh, there's not Eucharistic sharing. Uh, th this is uh, something that is perceived uh, in some sectors of all Christian traditions and communions. Vatican II the, has a very strong decree on ecumenism. You know, the, the Vatican has been very dedicated in uh, doing what it can, you know, within limits, of course, to uh, overcome the divisions, especially, I think, in their outreach to the Eastern Orthodox Christians. But th there's, there's a new openness uh, on their part to trying to work together to see if we can not live more faithfully in accord with uh, Christ and the gospel, because there's uh, this perception that uh, there are true Christians in all of the different denominations and traditions, and yet we're divided at the point where we ought to be uh, the most united. So it's a matter of faithfulness to Christ and obedience to the gospel 
that we should all strive to do what we can from our side to make sure that uh, we are all one. And, and there's a kind of a, a scandal to this wound uh, around the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. In, the, in your book, The uh, Eucharist and Ecumenism, uh, you say this, the Christian community is called to attest, mediate, and anticipate the unity of Christ in the Eucharistic assembly. Can you expound on that? Well, uh, we did talk once before about Colossians 3.3, 3, you have died and your life is hid with Christ in God. Uh, I think there's a sense in which that's true of our unity in Christ. It, it's hid with Christ in God. Uh, we are one and uh, we need to become one. We need to become what we are. So attesting that unity means attesting it in its reality as it exists in Christ with God. That can't be undone, uh, even by our uh, uh, divisions. But it also needs to be anticipated. There will be a day when these divisions uh, will be made to seem rather ridiculous and uh, indefensible, but they won't be in force anymore. Uh, uh, I, I actually like to think of uh, uh, the promised future in terms of uh, a meal, in terms of the Messianic banquet or the marriage feast of the Lamb. And, and in fact, I think the Lord's Supper or the Eucharist is the present tense form of that final meal. You know, it, it, it's, it's, the, it's the presence of that future here and now. It, it anticipates, it's, 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 I think actually, you know, as I talked once before about the last judgment, the cross of Christ and uh, pre-temporal election as being three forms of one and the same event. The Messianic banquet, the last supper, and the Last Supper and, and Calvary uh, together in a complex unity. These are three forms of one and the same event. So the Lord's Supper also mediates that unity and the uh, uh, present tense form of that unity is most uh, significantly and uh, intensively expressed when the church gathers together around the table in order to celebrate uh, the Lord's Supper together. So that, that's bringing uh, uh, Christ in his saving significance uh, into the present from the past where his once for all sacrifice was accomplished. And it's also anticipating that which is yet to come. So we're attesting something, something that has taken place in its uh, perfect and definitive sense, the finished uh, saving work of Christ, the once-for-all aspect of it. The only thing we can do in that respect is to attest it. We can't add to it. It doesn't need to be added to. Uh, we can't possibly add to it. It's, it's a finished and perfect work. But we're called to be witnesses to Christ and his uh, once-for-all uh, obedience uh, and saving sacrifice. We attest it. We anticipate that future form that it will take. Uh, in the kingdom of God, and it should be mediated here and now, which means that we shouldn't be excluding one another from uh, our uh, individual uh, denominational celebrations of the Lord's Supper. If we're doing that, we need to dig in to the roots of what's behind these divisions and asking what can be reasonably and faithfully done to overcome them so that that uh, invisible unity, which already exists, can be made more fully visible uh, for what it is here and now. So ironically, when a church that doesn't have communion with other churches or share communion with other churches partakes of communion, they're actually attesting and anticipating the day when that very attitude and exclusion <laughs> will not exist anymore. I, I think so, yes. <laughs> but see, the, the people who have these exclusions think that they're the only true church, and that the ecumenical solution is that we should all join their church. And you know, every denomination has people like this, you know, has formations like that. I mean, to me, it just can't be true. I mean, the, there are real Christians uh, spread throughout the churches, and uh, it needs to be 
worked out that the, these sinful divisions are suffered and overcome and not just tolerated and uh, written off uh, as if they're insignificant. A another thing to keep in mind is the shape of world Christianity. I mean, there are about six billion people in the world, roughly. These are rough figures. How many of them are Christians? Well, roughly a third of them are Christians. So there are about two billion Christians in the world. So let's just stick with that. That's, that's a pie-shaped graph. How many of those two billion are Roman Catholics? Turns out about half of them. So 2.2 2 billion, 2.1 billion, maybe a little more. I mean, ha half of that pie-shaped graph are Roman Catholics. What about Eastern Orthodox churches? It's hard to find out. I actually wrote to some Eastern Orthodox scholars. You know, it de depends on how you define Eastern Orthodox churches. And you know, are we talking about active members or you know, people just on the rolls? I mean, you get these kind of problems with the statistics. But you know, as a ballpark figure, 15 to 17% more. So we're looking at almost 70% of the world's Christians that have this high sacramental understanding of the church and uh, the Christian life. Well, uh, what about Protestants? Protestants as a whole, including uh, Anglicans and Episcopalians, they, they might be another 20%, but they're fragmented you know, among themselves. And I, I think this is right. I, I think there are more Anglicans than there are Lutherans you know, within this little piece of the pie, and there are more Lutherans than there are Reformed. So I, I'm a Reformed uh, theologian, I'm a Presbyterian minister, but you know, I represent one sliver of world Christianity, maybe, maybe one or two percent in there, and then of course where things are burgeoning is with the Episcopalians and the Charismatic churches. But, but the Roman Catholic Church also is uh, growing uh, very rapidly in the global south. But, but you know, my little sliver there uh, is, you know, where I have my home, so I think about that. Do you know how many different Reformed denominations there are? They did a study of this. The World Council of Churches, the World Alliance of Reformed Churches, they did a study. They were shocked. There are 750 different Reformed denominations. So it's like you've got this little sliver of pie. You have to be like a Japanese chef, you know, one of those cleave. You know, you got to divide that little sliver up into 750 pieces. Well, see, from a Catholic standpoint and an Orthodox standpoint, that's exactly what they would expect. I mean, they, they thought you, you get rid of uh, bishops, you get rid of any... Uh, institutionalized form of authority, you're going to fragment. You're, you're going to disintegrate. Well, we're not back in the 16th century anymore. I mean, the evidence is in. Uh, Protestantism is fissiparous, as they say. You know, it, it, it breaks up into parts. You, know, uh, you, you may know the little book by C.S. Lewis, The Great Divorce. And uh, you know, Lewis's idea of hell is that uh, Nobody can get along with anybody else, so they, they're constantly moving away from one another. I mean, this is almost an image for Protestantism. You know, I mean, uh, every time somebody uh, does something that you think is wrong, you do what's right in your own eyes, and you form your own little new uh, denomination. Well, I mean, there's something wrong with this picture. There's something wrong with this picture. We, we, we need to give serious thought to what it would take to bring the church into some sort of tolerable unity. And to me, that means Eucharistic sharing. It doesn't mean one monolithic church structure, but the Catholics and the Orthodox, they have their own set of criteria about what would be necessary if uh, the divisions in the church were to be healed and overcome. And you know, here I have to be both pragmatic as well as principled, you know, because I'm thinking we got 70% of the world's Christians that we need to bring into some sort of reconciliation uh, along with all these other Protestants. And I actually don't know what to do uh, in my book uh, about 
Pentecostals and Anabaptist uh, uh, traditions. Uh, so I, I just sort of factor them out for the time being. And it's finally got to be a work of the spirit and not the work of a theologian. So uh, I, I figure I'll just leave that to one side because I, I don't know what to do about that. But we're not going to achieve consensus. And in the ecumenical movement, it's understood now that visible unity in the form of uh, a single church structure is not only not going to be achieved, it's not necessary. So one of the terms that is used is reconciled diversity. So the project in my book, in part, is how can we widen the circle of acceptable diversity? Uh, and I've tried to go back to uh, some little known developments from the time of the Reformation that I think would be fruitful for my tradition, the Reformed tradition, to adopt, and that might have some appeal uh, across the board. You know, you know, I, I've gotten pretty favorable reviews, actually, so far from Roman Catholic uh, writers. The Orthodox are uh, a, a question unto themselves. I mean, they, they think they have the true church and they won't let, I mean, when I would talk to people about my book and I say, well, you know, I think the divisions about the word supper as they developed in the West uh, have a lot to do with the absence of an Eastern Orthodox voice at the time of the Reformation. Things split apart and polarized in the history of the Western churches that the Orthodox have held together. And I thought they would say, oh, this is great. You know, you want, you want to make ecumenical progress and you want to draw upon uh, the Orthodox traditions. Oh, it's like, so what? You know, my words fall to the ground. They, it's, the, the average view is like, they don't need us. Uh, they, you know, we're, we're, we're very problematic. And the, the solution uh, is that we should all become Orthodox. And even when the Orthodox participate in uh, the World Council of Churches events, uh, that's kind of the underlying attitude. They're, they're waiting for the rest of us to find our way back to Eastern Orthodoxy. Well, I, I don't think that that's the solution. I think the Catholics will actually bear the burden of uh, achieving that reconciliation with the Orthodox. But meanwhile, uh, in my hope of expanding the circle of acceptable diversity, I had to figure out some way of determining what views are church dividing. That's the way they talk uh, ecumenically. What views are church dividing and what views aren't? So how do you know what views are church dividing and what aren't? Well, it so happens that Vatican II decided, so this is an official Roman Catholic position, Vatican II decided that there are no obstacles. In Vatican II being a full church council. Of, of the Roman Catholic Church in the 1960s. You know, Vatican II decided that there are no obstacles in principle, you have to state this carefully, from the Roman Catholic side to uh, Eucharistic sharing with the Orthodox. But the Orthodox hold any number of views that are different from official Roman Catholic teaching. So if there are places, as there are, where Eastern Orthodox views are more possible for Protestants than Roman Catholic views as we're familiar with them, then if we can adopt those views without compromise, as I think we often can, we have, there's an ecumenical imperative that we ought to move in that direction for the sake of achieving uh, unity and, and Eucharistic sharing. So I try to argue that nobody has to give up anything that is essential to them, but everybody has to stretch to accept some things that they thought they had to reject. And I think the history of uh, the Eucharistic controversies has largely been a history of false contrasts and trying to show that things can be held together that uh, were split apart 
is an important part of uh, the argument in my book. I'll give you just one example. It's a simple example and not a terribly complicated one. But in my tradition, uh, we talk about the Lord's table. And there was a professor uh, in a previous generation at Princeton Seminary who used to tell his students, uh, it's a table and not an altar, and it's not a table unless you can put your feet under it. So table is good and altar is bad. And if you uh, read Luther's catechisms and so on, he's constantly using the phrase, the sacrament of the altar. Well, he gets this phrase from Augustine, and, uh, you know, to me, there's nothing wrong with it. But when Luther starts using it, and then as the Lutheran tradition developed, there's a kind of hardening. You know, it's not just a rhetorical term anymore. It becomes more of a semi-technical term. It's an, it's an altar. Well, see, altar has its metaphorical home in priestly and cultic activities. And table... I think has its home in thinking about the royal office of Christ, Christ as the Messiah, you know, the, the Messianic banquet. Uh, the priestly office of Christ and the royal office of Christ can't possibly exclude one another. These are two different ways of talking about one and the same Jesus Christ and his work of salvation. Uh, and it, again, it's not like uh, a, a pie where you divide them up into parts. See, these are two ways of looking at Christ as a whole. So there is a term in the tradition. Uh, and I, I learned about it from reading a Roman Catholic, uh, reading an Eastern Orthodox writer, Alexander Schmemann, who has this wonderful book called The Eucharist. And in that book, even though he primarily talks about the sacrament of the kingdom, and he uses table imagery and so on. So royal, I mean, in a way, the, the Eastern Orthodox ethos is, uh, even though it doesn't exclude the priestly, it's oriented toward the splendor of uh, the, the kingdom of God, you know, the, the gold and the icons and the uh, precious gems and so on in their I mean, there's, there's something royal about this. Uh, uh, Shmeiman uses the term altar table. So I, I was at a, I was at a conference, uh, I was asked to speak in, in Strasbourg, all these uh, ecumenical figures uh, from across Europe were there. And I said, Schmemann has this great phrase that he uses that shows how we bring things together that uh, in other places have been split apart. So my, my tradition will say table, but it won't say altar. You know, Lutherans tend to say altar, but maybe not so much table. Uh, it's a false contrast. You, know, you don't have to uh, polarize around this. So Schmemann has this great term, and the next day, the uh, Eastern Orthodox speaker from Romania got up and said, now, I have to correct one thing that uh, Professor Hunsinger said the other day. It's not just Schmemann who talks about altar table. We all talk this way. And you know, this was simultaneous translation. He was speaking in German, and he had a German text and, you know, photographs of Eastern Orthodox liturgies and so on. And, and right there in the German text was Alter Tisch. You know, there it was. Mm -hmm. So I started watching for it. And actually, uh, this is a term that has deep historic roots. Uh, I've seen it in uh, some Roman Catholic uh, writings. And in the Reformation, there was a figure named Martin Bucer, who was the reformer of Strasbourg. And uh, if you remember, there was a period when Calvin had been called to Geneva, uh, and then he ran into conflict with uh, uh, the city fathers, and he had to leave Geneva. He went to Strasbourg, and Martin Bucer became uh, uh, Calvin's mentor, and then later Calvin went back to Geneva. But uh, Bucer is an important figure. That's what I'm getting. He's also very ecumenically minded and, and even in the, that period was striving to do what he could to hold the Reformation together and to uh, make sure that there weren't these divisions about the Lord's table. But Bootser also knew the term altar table. So th there's no good reason, it seems to me, why Reformed Christianity or Protestants in general can't develop this vision that we need both the priestly and the royal aspects. And, and this actually 
a, a perception that has a lot of uh, implications that we might want to talk about, but the priestly side has been lost by much of Protestantism. We, we have an atrophied understanding of the priestly elements of worship and of the Eucharistic uh, liturgy. And, you know, the, the Catholics still have priests. You know, the Orthodox still have priests. You know, the Episcopalians have priests. We don't have priests anymore. We have ministers. And we have the priesthood of all believers, which, which is great. I think that's important. But what does it mean? You know, it's almost a, uh, a priesthood without a portfolio. I mean, it, it, it doesn't have a, a great deal of meaning. And, well, each person is a priest to every other person. Fine. You know, we, we intercede for one another. Fine. But it, 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 doesn't, it doesn't have a lot of uh, uh, development and, and it, currency. And recovering that priestly side of things uh, that, see, it's not just the Messianic banquet, which would be royal. It's the marriage feast of the Lamb, which is priestly and cultic. These are two, and, and in the book of Revelation, what's happening? It's the Lamb who's sitting on the throne or who is beside, I mean, the royal aspects, the, the, the royal uh, activities and, and offices are somehow assimilated to the Lamb. I mean, to me, this suggests that there's something central to this priestly complex of images that uh, we need to recover. Uh, liberal Protestantism uh, had an aversion to all things priestly. You know, I, I read something recently by H. Richard Niebuhr, who I have a lot of respect for, but you know, he taught you know, sacrifice and blood and these primitive ideas. You know, they, they, they thought they could move beyond all that. They, they, expiation, I mean, who, uh, propitiation, you know, who needs that? Uh, see, we, we need to find a responsible way of recovering these ideas without theological compromise because they're essential to reestablishing the Eucharistic unity of the church. So I, I'm looking for ways in which we can stretch to accept things we thought we had to reject without theological compromise. And we're, we have to tolerate a, a fair amount in other traditions and communions that we're not entirely comfortable with. But if we can just reach the point where we're not excluding one another, from uh, our celebrations of the Eucharist, that would be huge. It would be the correct thing to do in its own right, but it would also have great implications for uh, the church's witness to Christ uh, in the world. You've been watching You're Included a production of Grace Communion International.